Hello there, welcome back to the channel. This is Nerd World History and continuing the series on the various different Celtic tribes of pre-Roman Britannia. Today's episode will be on the Parisi, but before we get started, this episode has a sponsor and that sponsor would be the Beard Struggle, who sponsor this lovely growth on my face. At the end of the video, I will be doing more of an exploration of the products that they sell. This in particular is my most recent purchase, which is a beard oil, which is more just to replenish the stuff I already had, as this is something I use very regularly to maintain a healthy and strong beard that doesn't constantly fall out, look patchy, and generally is straight and rather glorious sometimes. I won't go on about them too much at the beginning of the video, but if, if you have a beard or you're planning to grow one and you want to learn more about the products that the Beard Struggle are selling and the things that they do, I'm going to go through at the end of the video with a small segment on the things I have, the website and the various other items that you can purchase from them. So with that said, let's move on to what you actually clicked on this video for, and that would be the pre-Roman tribe of what is now Yorkshire in northeast England known as the Parisi. Well, hello again and welcome back to the channel. And today, as I think I may have just mentioned, this is on the Parisi tribe, which originate in Yorkshire. And I say originate, I will get to that. There's some conjecture over it. Please like, share, subscribe, and comment down below what you know or think about this tribe or whether you have your own opinions on them. The tribe is an interesting one from pre-Roman Britain. Now I went into this, I'll be honest, I know more about the Parisi tribe of Gaul than I do about this one. So I had to do a little bit more research and I went into it assuming that the Parisi tribe in Britannia were of Belgic origin and were probably an offshoot of the Parisi that live in Gaul. And guess where they came from when they lived in Gaul? And just like the Atrobartes or the Belgi, or some of the others, they simply migrated here for one reason or another. Now that is possible. One, there are a few possible explanations for the existence and naming of this tribe, all of which are equally plausible. The first and most obvious one is that this tribe is related to the Parisi tribe in Gaul, and either because of Julius Caesar's invasion, conflict with other tribes, um, or general pressure from Rome, or another reason we don't know, they decided to move into Britannia and they annexed territory in Yorkshire rather than just arriving in southern Britannia which would have been probably been more difficult because it was a little more crowded by other tribes that were trying to do the same thing. You've got the Catavalloni in central England trying to conquer everything in sight. You've got the Atrobartes annexing territory and the Belgi annexing territory in Britannia while they've still got territory in Gaul as well. It's entirely plausible. Another possibility is, like I said, that as Julius Caesar invaded Gaul, the Parisi fled, unable to stand against him. They, we know that they were defeated by Julius Caesar on the continent. It's possible refugees simply made it here and either peaceably settled or were able to conquer territory themselves of somebody else. It's not entirely clear. The other option, interestingly, some people believe that it goes the other way. That actually the Parisi started here and migrated south. Now there are plenty of times that British tribes went to live in the continent for one reason or another, especially before the Romans turned up. There is evidence for it in naming, there is evidence for it in some of the archaeology, and also it's logical. If there are people are coming here, there's movements of people, people are going there. How much of it? Don't know. But apparently there are some that believe that actually the Parisi started here. And this is mostly done through linguistics and naming. Yes, Parisi is the origin of the word Paris, which is the capital city of modern France, of course, but that doesn't mean that, that word originated in France. Languages are fluid, and as I will get to in an upcoming video where I'm going to very tentatively touch on this subject, and I mean tentatively because I'm not a linguist, so I'm going to go through some theories that I have read and other people who are far smarter than me have drawn conclusions on. And it's all about linguistics and the interconnectivity of cultures. Celtic culture could be argued, and in fact is argued, that back in the Bronze Age it certainly existed. 
it just wasn't as widespread. You've got proto-Celtic cultures, not like the beakers necessarily, but beaker culture certainly would go on to influence as everything kind of a melting pot, but there are obvious connections between Nordic and Celtic culture, for example. These are obvious in their artistic styles, in their religions and other such things. Although they certainly are different, they both likely splintered off from a similar root religion and there's even a theory that another major religion that still exists today also splintered off from this same root religion in Indo-European cultures, which were pre-Iron Age, like back in the Bro early Bronze Age, things like that. Anyway, so as I said, doesn't necessarily mean just because Paris is associated with France now doesn't mean that it was always that way. In fact, the name Parisi is thought to derive from a much older name in Celtic languages. That being the Celtic name Parjo, which has a very interesting spelling, but typical Celtic languages, which are basically like Welsh, they don't have um, much in the way of consonants, vowels, or anything I can pronounce. It actually starts with a KW, I'll put it on the screen. And Pargio may have evolved into Parisi, and that is a word in local dialect in Britannia. But again, this is inconclusive and easily you can easily argue against it because Celtic languages were all related. And although they weren't quite the same, there were similarities between the kind of languages spoken in Gaul, Switzerland, Germany, Spain, and Britain and Ireland enough that perhaps someone who was born in northern Scotland in the, I don't know, second century BC, they travel all the way to Switzerland, they could maybe model through. And I stress the maybe because this is such an open topic. And as I'm not a strong linguist, feel free to argue with me in the comments about it. It's just what I have read based again on other far smarter people's research over the years. I can't speak these languages so I can't really testify to it but I can testify to the fact that languages move and evolve and grow over time. They assimilate other words, they assimilate grammar and structure as they move and this is the basic fundamental reason why they think the Parisi may have actually originated in Britain and moved south. It's also possible outlying this is an outline possibility, and one is more my speculative theory, and not one I genuinely think is right, I'm just saying it's possible, because the languages are related. And words in a Celtic dialect in Britain have a similar or identical meaning to a Celtic dialect over in Switzerland again. You can have two tribes with the same name that are not remotely related, just because they adopt a word to name themselves for their local area, which is something I will get to again in that upcoming video. I'm going to explore some of the Celtic religion a little more. And into that is going to be some of the linguistics, because it's sort of all interconnected. But basically, like in their religion, Celts didn't believe... They did have gods, of course, they had their own pantheon. But someone in Spain didn't necessarily worship the god Tomasi. Tamasi was the god of the river Thames. This is because the Celts, unlike say in Nordic culture, you've got Odin, Thor, Loki, obviously. These are gods who are the supreme gods and everyone knows about them. The Celts believed in local deities, a god of a specific mountain, a god of an ocean, a god of a lake, a god of... The, but whatever. There were a few gods that were more broad, you know, god of water, god of rain, whatever. But generally you were talking about local deities worshipped only locally and probably only intermittently beyond that and the further away you went from their center of power and knowledge the further away you got from them and as a result you had tribes and place names named after these local deities but in some instances you would have words that would translate and travel further and you would have names that would spread a little more widely and that is as a result a possibility to explain the Parisi that could have been an independently evolved people called the Parisi here and in France. Now to be honest again I don't think that's the case. I personally and this is only my personal opinion again opinion feel free to disagree I think it's more likely that the Parisi tribe that, evolved, that developed in Gaul migrated here either because of Roman or other outside pressures by other tribes and they came here 
as refugees and they established a territorial outpost in Britannia that outlived their existence on the continent. I think that's more likely, but that's just me. That's only because that happened so many other times with so many other tribes. It just seems infinitely more likely. One of the things that kind of mess up the timeline of the Parisi is the Parisi themselves. The damn Celts didn't write anything down. The damn Druids didn't write anything down. And this is the same everywhere across Europe. They very rarely wrote anything down, would be the more accurate description. And usually the Celts who did write things down were talking Celts who were on the fringes of the Greeks or Etruscan world and they adopted languages and writing from these cultures. It didn't usually spread further afield. Now there is a domestically evolved written language used by some Celtic cultures here and there. Uh, you had, in, again, you had tr cultures in Spain who were heavily influenced by the Romans and by the Carthaginians and they would adopt their alphabets and languages to a degree. And in Britain you have something known as Ogham script. It's more commonly found in Ireland. When exactly that evolved, don't know, but it was a written language that's domestically evolved, it just wasn't a very complicated one. The point is, writing was available and they chose not to do it because they preferred oral tradition and oral training. And that's just simply the way it was. So yeah, they kind of mess up their own timeline. There is a Celtic culture, which is sometimes, there are different phases of Celtic culture, but one of them is known as the Latin culture. Latin culture is not necessarily a reference to a specific culture. Celtic culture is very broad, diverse and difficult to quantify and explain in any of my videos, which is why I don't go into a great deal of detail and I basically encourage you to try and learn about it yourselves. I'm giving you the broad strokes here. Broadly, Latin culture is a reference to an artistic style that started in the Latin region on the continent, which gave it its name. And the artistic style is something you see in all Celtic cultures as it spreads out across the Celtic speaking world, the Celtic cultured world, where again language and religion and culture was all similar enough and they all adopt this artistic style. This is a bit like in sort of Victorian Europe, everyone starts to adopt the Gothic style. You could refer to that period as the Gothic period if you wanted to because everyone started using it. It's the same idea. It's an artistic flair and style to the way that they dressed, the way that they made weapons, the way that they made art, the way that they made tools and equipment, and all were very, very similar. The way they fired it, the way they made the metal, and more importantly, the way they, they forged it, the way they would twist it and decorate it. This artistic style is distinctive enough that you can link it. It's also a way to trace back the timeline. From about 300 BC, this style starts turning up in the Parisi territory in Britannia, indicating the arrival of Celtic culture to that area. Now that, again, is divisive because how do you define what Celtic culture is? Is it purely the arrival of the Ten culture? Was it the arrival of outsiders? Was it the spread of the language? A bit like um, Christian missionaries arriving and converting the local people? Or was there an outright invasion? It's it's murky because it's prehistory and we don't know. But one of the things that defines them is the Parisi used to bury their dead. They had chariot burials and other such things which are very similar to the way they bury the dead on the continent. Now this had gone out of practice by the time the Romans turned up but that's because things change over time. There will have been a culture that existed in the area. There's been habitation there for thousands of years so these weren't a new people, this was a new a new social class or possibly just a new wave of ideas that enter the area. If that's the case then it wasn't necessarily the Parisi if the Parisi were the ones from Gaul. If it was the Parisi it may have been the ones from Gaul invading or again it may have been another set of confluences altogether. It's almost impossible to say. Again I lean towards personally it being the Parisi arriving in the area either as a wave of people converting the locals to their way of life and their way of thinking. Now bear in mind by 300 BC Celtic culture was firmly established in Britannia so the people that were living there were already a Celtic or at least a proto-Celtic culture or society and likely the precursor of the Parisi that would ultimately live there because they didn't just invade an area and replace the local population. Again you got to think of it perhaps more like warrior priests entering an area and converting the local population to their way of thinking or adapting them into them into their culture. 
but there is some some evidence that it was a sort of a continuation of a, of a society there which adopted this new artistic style and things coming in from the continent because let's face it when new and exotic things arrive people want them you got this new mirror with all these nice swirly patterns on it and a nice shiny face who's not going to want to buy that for his wife he thinks that's nice i'll get that for her and you use the connections of the celtic world via the druids the massive trade links and networks to import and export all of these goods all across the celtic world calling it an empire is not the correct term these were interconnected related peoples but they were not a coherent unified people. They were unified only by language, culture and religion. They were not the same society. So, quite frankly, even if this is the Parisi from Gaul, it's entirely possible. They're an entirely different set of people. Alter. It's so complicated. As I said, I encourage you to try to learn about this because it is a complicated mess of different overlapping archaeological and anecdotal evidence. Now the Romans do mention the Parisi when they arrive in Britain, but interestingly they're not mentioned, I don't believe, by Julius Caesar in his invasion, which could again indicate that they were refugees that came here later, meaning that their culture simply replaced or absorbed whatever was already here, more likely absorbed or assimilated into. Their capital is a little un unknown, but the, Ro the Roman civitas of Peturia was probably, possibly, the tribal capital as well. That's usually the way the Romans did it. They'd make the local tribal capital the local capital of the new Roman territory. It's plausible. It's also, Peturia has Celtic origins in a Celtic word meaning the word forth, which has led some discussion as to whether or not there were other tribal capitals basically named one, two, three, four. Not personally going to subscribe to that. That settlement still exists in Britain as Burr on Humber. And yeah, other than the fact that there's no evidence they put up any resistance to the Romans, it seems like the Parisi, if they were the Parisi from the continent and had fled the Romans, they maybe thought twice about fighting them, or they just realized how pointless it was after seeing the defeats of the Caravalloni, who were the most powerful tribe and other tribes like the Iceni and the Trinovante simply capitulate and, and ally themselves, or tribes like the Dabuni gain their independence from their overlords, the Catavalloni, by simply, again, allying with the Romans and getting all that their hearts desired. It seems like they just friendly and warmly welcome the Romans in, although it is possible that they received some pressure from their neighbours, the Brigantes and the Coriol Talvi, to capitulate. They may have been under, under the thumb or under the screws from these larger, more powerful tribes that had already decided to side with Rome, and they would have been very isolated from any potential allies, particularly to the south or to the north, such as the Votadini or others who would have resisted Rome. They would have had to not only fight the Romans, but fight their immediate Celtic neighboring tribe, tribal kingdoms as well. So, putting myself in the mindset of someone from that time period, you've basically got two options. You've got to fight a war on multiple fronts against multiple enemies, all with the same objective of conquering you in the name of Rome, or become a client kingdom of Rome, give up a little bit of freedom and money to the Romans, but hopefully maintain some level or portion of your former identity. In later years, in the post-Roman period, this area would be known as, forgive my pronunciation, Gower? I'm putting it on the screen. I can't pronounce that. And yeah, that is the Parisi. Discuss in the comments below what you think about them, what you think is the most likely origin for them, because I think that is probably one of the most interesting questions about this tribe. Who and where did they come from? Who were they? Where did they come from? Put it in the comments below, and again, that's the Parisi. Okay, so if you stuck around after watching that episode, here is the segment on the Beard Struggle. The Beard Struggle produce beard and skin related products currently, which are part of their new range of things known as the Skin Struggle. Something I can also testify to with sometimes slightly blotchy skin. They provide, as I said, a service that helps men maintain and grow a healthier, stronger beard that won't be as patchy, it allows it to be more maintained and straight. If you ever see those men on adverts and on television who have 
very straight, very ordered beards, and you think that it's some kind of studio artist maintaining it that way. Probably is, but they still need the right tools to do it. And one of those tools would be this thing, which is currently called the Carbon X, which is what I have. I have the previous generation of it as well, tucked away in a bag somewhere, I now use for travel purposes, although this one does come with its own bag. The bag that you can get off the website as well, is sort of a large toiletries bag, which these things are quite big, so they, you know, with all the stands and charger and stuff that come with it, there's a lot to travel with. But this basically helps you maintain and straighten your hair. It is literally what it sounds like. It is a beard straightener and brush all in one. So you don't have to turn it on. You can just use the bristles and use it to generally brush and straighten your hair, as well as to volumize with these nice little extremely hot prongs on the ends. As you can see, it has different settings that I'll briefly go through, which are basically, you can change the temperature setting I usually have it on a full setting because my beard's quite thick and it does need a little bit more attention giving to it. You also have these that are quite nice for generally going through all the lovely bits. And this thing works wonders for stopping all the stray hairs from growing out at the sides of your beard, which generally, if I don't know if you'll have noticed in any of my previous videos, my beard can be a little wild and unruly and it's naturally curly. When I had her here, it was blonde and curly and ringlety. And my beard isn't far off, aside from being a different color, which weirdly has always been a different color. Even when I was younger, I had blonde hair and a dark beard. I've been able to grow a beard since I was about 13. So it's always been a thing, but it grows very curly and very ringlety, particularly at the sides. And then, if given enough, if given chance, it'll just turn into a ball of curls on my face. And this thing comes in very useful keeping on top of that, as do some of the other products that I'll show you now that they have. Now, this is just a small sampling of the various things you can purchase that will help you, as I say, grow, maintain, and keep a decent beard on your face without it resorting to turning into just a fuzzball on your face and making you look like some kind of demented Santa. Sometimes I do look like. The first one would be the beard oils, which we have very slowly about to be opened here. And they come in these rather handy little bottles with an applicator as well as telling you what the different flavors and other things are. They call them a beard tonic, but it's just a beard oil. Beard oils vary in what they're for. They have a variety of different scents, but they have two primary types of beard oil that they sell, which would be, one is a day beard oil, which is to help keep your beard under control, keep it healthy, protect it from UV rays. It's mainly designed to actually help your skin under the beard as well, because guys that have beards, we have the infamous beard rough and yes that is exactly what it sounds like just on your face this helps to some degree to counter that i'm not going to say it's like a cure the best solution to beard rough would be to wash your beard which they also provide shampoos and conditioners for but this does help maintain healthy skin and hair the next one the very other variation would be the night elixir which is exactly what it sounds you put some of this on before you go to bed at night not a lot because you don't want to get it all over your bed sheets you get them in various scents, obviously to match the one you're using during the day, but you don't have to, vary it if you want. That's also rather nice. During the day, the other one to use would be the Warrior's Balm. Again, I tend to get them all in the same scent, but they also have waxes and butters, all similar. If you're interested as well, a butter and a, a balm, basically the same thing, but a butter is thinner and for more fine beard. This, because again, my beard is a little thicker, um, needs more styling. This helps maintain the style. Wax is the best for that, but you can use this and it will help hold the shape of your beard. And again, it protects it from light damage and other pollutants in the air as best as it can do. And it more importantly as well, holds the shape of your beard a little better. Again, the wax would be better if you've only got a fine or a light beard, the butter is just fine, but they're pretty much the same price. They come in the same, you get the same amount. I personally prefer the balm because it's a little thicker and it's a little stronger and generally works better. You also have a range of colognes. This is only from the sample set. I'm waiting on my bigger one to arrive, but they have a variety of these, which like what it sounds like cologne, but here, wherever you want on all the major 
arteries. It smells rather nice. It's a more concentrated version of what's on the of the sense of the oils. And of course, they have a variety of other things that are on their website, which you can reach at thebeardstruggle.com. And on there again, there's also links to their skin struggle materials, which I will do in another video. If anyone actually <laughs> sticks around for this one, at some point I'll do videos on the skin struggle products as well. There are various other things that they get. For example, again, brushes, combs, and other things to help maintain and strengthen and other things, your hair, your face, your body in general, with various different scrubs as well as applicators of different kinds to help you apply the different things, as well as instructions. They have, if you visit their both their, their Instagram and TikToks and other things, many of the ambassadors do videos that are tutorials on how to use the product properly, what they do, and they often offer discounts as well. So that's probably something you should look up and go on their Instagram and find them. And yeah, if you stuck around for this, that's a small selection of the stuff I have. I do have more. In fact, I have a full cabinet full of the stuff, which hopefully I'll remember to put a picture of up on the screen of the various different things I own. And with that said, thanks for sticking around for that. I just want to take this moment to thank you for watching that video. If you liked what you saw, please check out my social links in the description box below to Instagram and Twitter and others. And there also is down there a link to my Patreon page where you can support this channel and the others as I try to grow this franchise and do this more regularly. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, thank you for watching and bye bye.